All right, so in this lesson, uh, I'm going to be teaching you about calipers, uh, the different styles of caliper. We have a uh, dial caliper, digital caliper, and a vernier caliper, um, as well as uh, the different measurement functions that each one has to offer. So there's four different measurement functions uh, that a standard caliper can, can do. This makes them extremely versatile and um, a go-to gauge for almost any inspection situation. Uh, depending on your application, it might be the most common tool that you're using uh, because it's pretty versatile, offers decent accuracy, although um, not as much accuracy as a uh, micrometer. But um, so let's just get started into the uh, overview. Um, so as mentioned, uh, three different styles, vernier, digital, and dial. Uh, they all read differently. A vernier scale is going to be uh, using this... Um, this linear scale, you're going to be looking for where the vernier scale lines up, and you're going to have to add these numbers together um, in order to get your final um, final reading. Um, a dial indicator makes that a little easier. It gives you this nice big dial for you to read, so um, you're going to be able to see partly where you are, close to where you are in your measurement, and you'll be able to use the dial to figure out your last part of it. So it's very easy to read. And then digital. Um, very, very easy to use. Um, gives you direct reading. Um, you can zero them and uh, get them to zero at a certain spot where you want to keep uh, take your measurement off of. Um, either way, um, whatever caliper you're using, um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about best practices for each one. Um, so when we're talking about the caliper, um, you know, let's go over the components of them so that. Um, you know, we can be on the same page uh, when you're talking to somebody. So first of all, when we talk about the jaws, um, we have a moving jaw and we have a fixed jaw. So this jaw here is my fixed jaw. It's not the one that slides around um, with the moving uh, bar. So um, we have a fixed jaw, we have a moving jaw. Um, you can take your reading uh, right here. Um, if you have a caliper that has uh, some sort of pressure wheel, uh, when you're using when you're using a caliper, um, you can apply pressure um, here with your thumb as you're closing on an object. Um, so that uh, little pressure, either there might be a wheel or it might be just a little nub like this one here. Um, this dial actually has a wheel. So as I'm um, applying pressure, rotating that dial, um, you can see that it's um, using this wheel can be very helpful for getting the same amount of pressure. Um, as I as I move across to each measurement, so um, hopefully your caliper has one. It's very handy. Um, if you don't have one, uh, you don't necessarily need it. You know this digital caliper here doesn't have one, but it's still useful. Um, they should all have some sort of lock um, at the top. So uh, we got a lock right here. When you engage that, can't move the the sliding jaw anymore. Disengage that, you'll be able to move it. And then when we talk about the uh, different jaws, so we have the outside jaws here uh, for taking uh, measurements uh, on the outside of something. And we have the inside jaws right here for taking measurements uh, on the inside of something. So um, taking a measurement on the inside of that hole right here. Um, we have a, a depth jaw. So on the back here, you have um, flat parallel surfaces on the fixed jaw and the moving jaw. So you can actually uh, take a reading. Uh, let's see. Try angle this correctly. Uh, you can take a reading and uh, measure from the from the surface plate here to the where this uh, where this fixed jaw sorry where this moving jaw stops when it reaches the part. So this is a great stable way to get a, a, a measurement if you have a surface plate. Um, you're going to need a flat reference. You can't just use this wood table here or a piece of paper underneath or anything. It's got to be a flat reference surface like a granite rock. Um, you know, this is a great way to do it. Another, another way to do it is to use your sliding bar on the back here. So this again, this, this very small point at the end uh, gives you uh, another another distance. So um, 
see on the camera. I'm gonna kind of get a nice flat uh, reading from the bottom of the caliper here to the bottom here. And that reads 1.001 .001 in this instance. So um, four measurement methods, uh, the dial and the vernier um, also offer the same uh, measurement uh, options. And, you know, take a look at your caliper. There, there may be different setups. Not every caliper is configured exactly the same. So um, how your moving jaws work, um, how, this, how they read on the scale, just take a quick look, make sure you understand uh, all that. Um, when you're reading uh, the caliper, as I mentioned before, you get a direct reading with the digital. Um, there's really nothing more to explain. Um, but I'll give you uh, an example here. So when, uh, when we're using the digital caliper, I want to just get a direct reading of a one inch right across the, the thickness of this part. Um, if I'm going to use, uh, let's say, let's say, let's compare all three for this uh, step thickness here, 605. So I'm reading uh, 605 with the digital caliper. I'm going to grab the dial caliper. And it's a little bit, a little bit slow moving. Now with the dial caliper, um, set this down. You can see um, on this scale here, I've gone way past the five, and I've actually gone a little bit past the six. And how far past the six is going to be determined by the dial. So this dial is telling me it's about 606. You can see that. Um, I would say 606, and maybe a tenth or two higher. Um, so that's how you read a dial. Again, it's pretty straightforward. It's almost a direct reading. Just need a little bit of math. With a vernier scale, uh, we're gonna we're gonna have to add the vernier reading. So uh, once again, um, we take a look at this uh, this caliper. Excuse me. Um, so we know we're around uh, 0.6 and a little bit more. So when we're reading this, uh, this caliper, um, the inch scale is on the top, and you can see where the zero is. You're at around 0.6, and then as you um, try to find 0.6 what, uh, what you add to it, you're going to look for whatever line here lines up perfectly with the scale here. It's not always easy. Um, sometimes it's going to be tricky because multiple lines will look the same. Uh, but this is how you read a vernier scale, and um, I do have another video that goes in much more depth on um, how to do this with better examples. Uh, so I advise you to check that out uh, where I really go into detail on, on how to read that. But for this video, we just want to focus on using the caliper and not necessarily reading it. So for the most part, I'm going to demonstrate everything uh, with the digital today. So as again, there's an example uh, with a dial. Um, you get to the 1.3 mark. You can see that with your eyes. You're past 1.3 um, on the jaw here. And then you use the dial to get that last piece. In this example, um, it's 45 thousandths that you're adding uh, to the last uh, part of the measurement to get 1.345. Uh, when I did it, um, it was 0.6, and then I added, I think it was 0.6 again. So 0.606 in uh, the example with this part. Okay, so as I mentioned, four measurement methods. Here's a kind of a quick summary of, of how you can use them. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate all of these uh, with this uh, part here. You can find the drawings uh, on the Pragmatic Metrology website if you like. Um, but to do the outside measurement, um, we'll grab, go you know, across the width here with the outside jaws. To do an inside measurement, we'll grab across the inside of this diameter, 0.968. Um, there we go. A little better reflection. Um, you can do other features. 391 should be about 625. Um, for the depth bar, um, you can drop it onto a feature and then bring it down. And you'll want to be careful to get everything lined up correctly. So uh, when you're using the depth bar, um, you're going to want to kind of rock it back and forth on the part um, to make sure that you are getting a nice flat surface, flat contact. And when you're looking at your part, 
uh, you're going to avoid any radiuses that might be on the inside. So if there are radiuses that your um, uh, depth bar is sitting on, um, it's going to be uh, a very bad reading for you. So a lot of features leave a, uh, a radius when you manufacture them um, or some sort of step. Um, so you want to watch out for that when you're using a depth bar. And uh, the same thing applies when you're using the um, depth jaw. So in this case, I just do it from the outside, and I get a nice uh, direct reading um, right here. Let's see if I can uh, pull that out, 1.001. Um, now, if you're doing this with from feature to feature, once again, you're going to want to make sure you're avoiding um, other radiuses. Um, maybe we could do it in this... Uh, in this uh, channel here be better. Uh, sorry, a little hard to demonstrate uh, when I'm trying to see this on the camera, but um, there we go. So I got a nice flat surface, nice flat contact. Um, try to show you from this angle, right? You want to make sure everything's nice and parallel, nice and flat. Um, and we're not on any sort of radius that might be in the corner here. Um, I know this was made with an end mill, so it should leave a pretty small radius, but you never know. Uh, so you want to visually check for that. Um, forgot to mention, you know, when you're using you know, the inside and the outside jaws, when you're using the outside jaws, um, go ahead and grab onto the part and kind of twist and shake and rock, and then you'll find a seating where everything fits um, nicely. So um, you want to make sure everything's engaged this way and, and um, this way. So um, you want to get nice, big, flat surfaces. And you're going to want to be kind of close to the root of where the jaws come out. Um, if you're not, if you're out here on the tips, uh, what a lot of people can do is they put too much pressure. You see it's uh, 2.350. If I keep adding pressure, I can make that uh, change by a thousandth. Um, but if I do that when it's at the jaw, no matter how much pressure, oh, <laughs> found a spot where it's a little lower. Um, it's probably the same spot. So 2.349. Uh, when I apply you know, some pressure, when I come out here with the tips, let's see, 2.349. Well, I can't demonstrate this. This play, this part is actually pretty flat. I don't think I can really demonstrate it, but um, the moral of the story: grab as much material as you can. Um, you know, when you're when you're taking a measurement, um, don't uh, don't just work with the tips because um, you could you could really mess yourself up if you get a, a part where you can actually make these jaws uh, flex. Uh, that would be very bad for your measurement. When you're using the inside jaws, it's a little bit more straightforward, but you need to kind of rock the part so that it seats as well. Um, so don't be afraid to really get in there. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you start too low and you just rock and slide, and, and I'm pulling out with my thumb to get even pressure, and then it's going to lock in place. I can no longer jiggle it. And 0.968. Probably going to go around. It's always a good idea with a, with a round part um, to check a few places. Um, make sure that the part is round, that the feature is round. Um, and when you when you're finished, um, you know, wipe off your jaws. Make sure you didn't pick up any chips, any oil, and um, make sure they close back at zero. Uh, we're going to talk about calibrating in a little bit, but um, that's how you do all four functions. Um, so we're gonna, gonna move on. Oops. Let's try this again. Hold on a sec. I apologize for There we go. Apologize for this little delay. So let's get caught up to where we were. Um, 
Now, when we're talking about calibration, um, you know, one of the first things you're going to want to do, uh, verify the tool is clean, there's no chips. Um, you're going to have to maybe wipe them off with your finger. Be very careful about that. These, these points can be sharp, um, but your finger will be a great way to, to, to grab onto oil and chips and, and wipe them off. Uh, especially with the outside um, jaws, they can be uh, much sharper. Um, and then when you're gonna, you're gonna check that everything's good when it's closed. So I've got zero here. Um, and one, one thing that you can do is hold it up to the light and, and see if uh, you can see any light between the jaws. Um, if you can, you know, if you can visually see light coming through um, your jaws when it's closed, then the jaws are no longer aligned. And if they're not parallel, they're really not usable because every, every place you take along the, the length of the jaw is going to give you a different reading. Um, so in that, if that's the case, um, I'm not going to show you because every caliper is different and this caliper is actually in good condition. Uh, but if, uh, if you need to, you might have to disassemble, um, loosen some screws, uh, close this back up, and then um, tighten the screws again and, and do your check again. So it doesn't happen all that often if you keep this in good condition. If you never drop it, if you always handle it properly. Um, but if, uh, you know, if, you, if you drop it, if you slam it around, if you, parts are on it, if it's oily, uh, if chips get jammed in there, something, something like this could happen. Um, so when you're, when you're ready, um, when you think everything's physically good with the jaws, um, go ahead, grab a jaw block, um, something, something that you know the, uh, the, the size of, and we're going to go through and we're going to measure this jaw block. So I've got 0 0.999. That's, uh, this really should be reading one inch. So let me, uh, let me re-zero it. And uh, we're going to go through and we're going to go through and check um, everything. So so here I've got one inch, pretty good, after I fix the zero. And I've got a ring gauge here, so I'm going to check the inside jaws. Uh, this is 0 0.99996. This is as close to one inch as we're going to get. The caliper is not going to be able to detect that level of accuracy. So we're going to aim for one inch with our inside jaws, and I'm going to sweep it around gently, kind of rock it, apply some pressure with my thumb. This is as close as I can get. So um, I would say maybe these outside jaws are two thousandths off, you know, one and a half, hard to, hard to tell exactly with the level of accuracy. Um, so that means any reading I take with the inside jaws um, is going to be off by about two thousands potentially. Um, I wouldn't recommend assuming that in all situations uh, because uh, it may be length dependent. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but um, I would definitely maybe have these calibrated uh, by an outside company or um, maybe even replaced if I was doing a lot of inside measurements. Um, we can do this again with the uh, the one inch block and the depth, uh, the depth bar, the depth jaw, I should say. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm doing this backwards. Hopefully the camera's picking it up. I'm gonna hold it and ooh, 0.999. So we're a little bit off from one. Uh, let me try that again and make sure I'm nice and flat. I'm gonna lock it down. 0.999. So I've repeated. It's the same situation. Maybe if I'm doing a lot of measurements this way, I want to have this calibrated by an outside lab. We're going to do the last one. Um, with the uh, sliding bar, the depth bar. And it's a little trickier. I'm trying to get, make sure I get parallel contact. And I get 1.001. 1 .001. Um, again, this tends to be the least accurate uh, way to measure anything with a caliper. So it's not unusual to see a problem here. Um, it's very flimsy. Um, it wobbles. And, you know, making sure you're nice and flat is, is difficult. So, but again, maybe you need an outside calibration lab to verify this. 
Uh, all right. So this was just going to let you uh, do a quick check, make sure everything is still in good condition. This is not really the official way to calibrate uh, a caliper, as we're going to talk about um, in another video. Um, you need traceability and you need a good method. And this is more of a sanity check to make sure that you've got a good piece of equipment. But um, an outside lab is, is probably going to be your best bet. They're not, they're not too expensive to calibrate. You know, um, it's usually worth the money for how much you used to get out of these. Um, one last thing I, I mentioned, you know, checking it at zero, um, doing some checks there. But you also want to do a mid-range check. So um, I did a one-inch uh, lock on the inside and the outside. But you should also double-check periodically throughout. Um, I've got three-inch block, and I've got 2.999. Um, if I grab a four-inch block, let's see what I got here. Four inch, I've got four inch. So it's not unusual for a caliper to be more accurate in one spot than another. Uh, the more you use these calipers, um, they can wear. You start measuring the same feature and the same size all the time. They can wear in that area. Or they can just get more, um, more error the larger you travel. So it's a good idea to check um, intermediate stages, uh, which is what calibration labs will do. Uh, for you. So um, here's a quick summary of, of what I did um, to check that the four functions are all um, in good condition. And you can see in the inside jaws I got 0.999 on, on this ring. So I could say yeah the 0.999 is maybe one thou off um, from what the ring is, is uh, known to be. So um, you're going to want to use a calibrated ring, obviously, and you're going to need to use calibrated jaw blocks or gauge blocks. Uh, that doesn't change. You're always going to need traceability, uh, but um, you actually want to know that these things that you're calibrating with um, are the right size. And you can even do it with a larger ring gauge. Um, you can grab, this is a, uh, what is this? This is a 72.0. 37 millimeter ring, so I'm going to switch this to millimeters. I'm going to try to switch this to millimeters. Hold on. There we go. Millimeters, reading zero. Flip on the uh, other camera. So I'm um, reading zero millimeters, and I should be reading 72.037 right there. When I open this up, let's take a look. So I'm at 71, 72.00, so I'm about 0 0.04, 0 0.03 off, uh, which uh, correlates with what we got when it was in inch mode. So um, maybe... If you have some other size rings, um, you double check that your caliper's in a good condition. And I'm going to switch this back to inch mode. Emma. It's very hard to push these buttons sometimes. Um, they're recessed, so you can't do it on accident. There we go. Back to inch mode. Um, so, yeah, that's exactly what you need to do. Um, if when you're ever going to check calibration. Um, you don't need to do this every time you use the caliper. I would definitely check the zero you know, when you close it. Uh, make sure that it's reading zero. Um, before you do anything super precise that you need to use caliper for, and you have no other choice. But um, otherwise, this type of thing might be periodically, maybe once a month, maybe once a year. You know, all depends on, on, on a lot of different factors, how much you use it, what your company policy is. Um, so I already mentioned, you know, calibration. I, I definitely recommend you do this with an outside calibration lab so that you get traceability, uh, which is something you're going to need um, if you're working in an ISO 9001 environment or pretty much any quality management system um, is going to recommend that. And, you know, try to remember if, you know, um, if this thing is, is not 
reading zero um, because of some some difference. Um, in this case, I'm reading 3 thousandths because I, I barely closed it correctly. Um, just pressing zero is not the same as calibration. That is somewhat correcting one potential problem, but it's not uh, fixing the problem entirely. So um, when you have these digitals, uh, just pressing zero is, is not going to cut it for calibration. Um, and, you know, my own personal recommendation, these these six-inch calipers are relatively inexpensive. You know, you'll get a good one for $100. Um, and for a lot of places, uh, this might last you several years, and then it wears away and gets looser, you know, gets coolant and chips, and it's no longer uh, holding its accuracy as well as it used to. And I just recommend maybe you replace it. Um, I know some people will keep their calipers in great condition for a long time, and, and that's great too. Um, but there's no point fighting if this is worn away, um, just having trouble with its accuracy. You know, don't be afraid to just replace it um, and, and guarantee your uh, uh, peace of mind that it's holding its accuracy. So I've mentioned accuracy a few times. Um, so you might be asking, well, how accurate are calipers? Um, like I mentioned at the very beginning, they're the most useful tool. They have the most functions, but pretty much of anything else we're going to cover, they have the worst accuracy. So, um, what does that look, you know, what does that mean? Um, so for a six inch caliper like this digital one or, you know, this vernier, um, or this dial, oh, this is an eight inch dial, uh, but this, uh, zero to six uh, digital, it's going to have bi-directional accuracy of 1,000. So what that means is anytime you take a reading, in this case I'm reading uh, one inch exactly, 1.000, could be plus or minus 1,000 and uh, still be within the accuracy of the gauge. So um, that gauge, as useful as it is, uh, one of the drawbacks that gives it that versatility is it's not quite as accurate as other gauges. So um, on a six inch scale, sorry, six inch size, um, it's going to be about plus or minus uh, one thousandth. And as these uh, calipers get much bigger, you know, they can go 12 inches, 24 inches. I've used some that are 40 inches and even larger than that. Um, the accuracy gets worse. So um, I only put the up to 12 inch range because that's what's pretty much most common. But um, uh, you know, double check with the manufacturer what the accuracy is, uh, because you know this ac this micrometer, sorry, <laughs> this caliper, this six-inch caliper is going to be more accurate than a 40-inch caliper. You can't assume the same accuracy as you get bigger. So I would say if you're not sure, you know, use 0 0.002 plus or minus. Uh, if you're not sure about your caliper, that'll be a good. Um, safe uh, number to use when you're taking a measurement. And, you know, the, ne the next question is usually, well, when can we use a caliper and when can't we? Um, and that comes down to the, uh, you know, 10 to 1 rule of thumb or the uncertainty of the gauge and the, and the measurement uh, tolerance, sorry, the uh, feature tolerance. But um, for what I'm recommending, I would say you at least need a 10,000 tolerance zone. And if your tolerance zone is smaller than 10 thousandths, uh, you're probably going to have to use something else. A caliper is just not going to be accurate enough to give you uh, confidence in your measurements. So I have a graphic here um, on the bottom to kind of illustrate this. Um, if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom line that goes from red to orange, to yellow to green, uh, back to orange to red, um, you know, each one of those boxes represents one thousandth of an inch. And that dot, that blue dot, rec uh, represents where your measurement lands. And if you have a plus or minus two thousandths, then that dot could be shifted to the right or to the left two thousandths. And when you're doing a tall, you know, when you're comparing it to a tolerance zone, um, if it falls into that, um, into that tolerance zone, you have to, you have to, um, double check that it's not too close to the edge. So um, if you are one thousandth away from your edge and you have a plus or minus two uh, accuracy, that's certainly possible you're going to be out 
of um, tolerance, and your caliper won't won't tell you. Uh, it's one of the downsides of using caliper, but it's true for most gauges. Uh, it's just worse because calipers usually have the larger um, accuracy. So um, if you're there in the green zone um, on the bottom, you go right, you go left, you're fine. You're still going to be in the tolerance zone. But after you move closer to those edges, you get closer to those warning signs, um, you, may need to, you may need to switch gauges if you're getting really close to your tolerance zone. Uh, depending on your company policy and how critical the part is, you may want to bust out a micrometer or a CMM or height gauge, something else that's more accurate to verify. So, um, yeah, let's talk about some rules of thumb. Um, first of all, you should be using calipers to check a stable process uh, because if you're checking something that's unstable, and you're using a gauge that has, uh, you know, a, a large accuracy, a uh, large possible error, um, you may not be catching everything in tolerance. You're going to be on the edge of your tolerance a lot, which may go out. So I would say a caliper is a great thing to use um, when your odds of failure are low, you have high confidence in your manufacturing process and the part. Um, you can do nice repeatable checks. You know, it's not difficult to hold. It's not very unstable. You get nice registration with your jaws, and you feel very confident using it. Um, if that's not the case, you may want to use a gauge that gives you more confidence, gives you a better setup, um, has a better accuracy. Um, the next one, the next thing I recommend is you know open tolerances. Nothing that's precision. Um, if we look at you know an example print. Um, up here on the on the screen, um, anything that says you know plus five tenths mi minus zero, that's not a good check uh, for a caliper. This is what this would be a very tight tolerance that a caliper is not capable of. But these all here, these three digit um, decimal points uh, measurements, uh, according to the title block. They're all plus or minus uh, five thousandths, which means you have a ten thousandths tolerance zone when you're using three digits on this drawing. And these would be great features to use the caliper for. They're clearance features for a bolt, uh, even though you don't necessarily know that. Um, it's open tolerance, so um, nothing, nothing that's too precision because this is not the most precision gauge that we have. Um, and then my last one, I've seen some people use calipers for some really crazy and interesting measurements. Um, but you just got to remember, no matter what you do, can you repeat? Can you take the caliper off and repeat the measurement and get the exact same reading? That's always important in measurement. And how many other features do you need? Do you need Joe blocks and one, two, three blocks and something else? And you got to do it from, you know, underneath the part and around it there may be a better way to do it. Uh, that may not be the most repeatable um, setup. So you know, once you take down your fixture, can you redo it? If you can't repeat it, you can't trust the measurement. So um, uh, when it comes to handling, I've, I've kind of mentioned this uh, before, but you know, when you're using this thing, uh, get a nice firm grip on it. You can't, you can't really hurt the, uh, the caliper uh, by, by, you know, obviously you don't want to drop it, so you want to have a nice firm grip um, here on the bar, on the fixed bar. Um, don't be afraid to grab it with both hands. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll register one jaw uh, this way and I'll hold it uh, with one hand, or sometimes I'll, if it's a really big part, I'll clamp it with both hands. You know, whatever you think gives you the most accuracy gets you the best reading. Um, don't be afraid. Uh, to, to experiment, you know, as I mentioned, you can you can do things that uh, if you try to do this with one hand, uh, it may be maybe a bit of a challenge. But if you bring in your second hand, spin it around, make it you know rock it on the rock there, get a nice firm reading. Uh, you can get a nice good measurement that way. So um, get comfortable holding it. It's not that delicate. Most of these are are pretty. Um, rigid and pretty stable um, 
machines. You don't you don't want to throw them around, obviously, uh, but you don't want to drop them either. So hold on to them um, as firmly as you can. Um, as I said, make sure those jaws are engaged, not sitting crooked. So um, you know, make sure you're you've got nice firm registration. And you're not at some weird uh, some weird angle. Um, do that on the. So yeah, make sure you get a nice grip that you're not at some weird angle. You can see that um, where it's not getting a nice uh, registration. I, I, I get in the habit of rocking and twisting and kind of jiggling everything into place that it's hard for me not to do it um, with, after using this for so many years. Um, when you're using a, uh, when you're measuring a round feature, whether it's internal or external, um, I recommend you, you get a, a measurement um, on the outside and you rotate it around to get another measurement because as you might be seeing, sometimes um, round parts are not actually all that round. So um, going around it multiple places, um, you want to go multiple places axially and um, around the diameter just to make sure. With a small part like this, it's a little bit hard to show, but as parts get larger and larger, they'll get more and more um, out of round, um, and your caliper will be able to pick that up pretty easily. Um, and, and when I'm using the caliper at all times, I don't know if you noticed already, but I'm always using my thumb to apply even pressure. I've developed this even pressure um, over time, um, and actually... I, uh, you know, periodically I compare it to a Joe block to see how much pressure. See, this might be too much pressure for this uh, this caliper uh, because I know that it's um, it's a little bit off when I put on my real pressure. So I need to maybe lighten my pressure uh, when I'm using this caliper. But just uh, just develop a little even pressure for everything you're using. Um, make sure it's consistent and double check with these Joe blocks uh, when you need to. All right. Um, and then last one, um, yeah, make sure your depth measurements are perpendicular. So um, I've seen a number of people when they're measuring uh, with the depth bar here, they'll be at an angle coming down and this will not give you an accurate reading. You're gonna have to make sure this is perpendicular that these uh, edges are flat. Um, so yeah, kind of rock it around, uh, twist it, tie a little bit of pressure, and then take your reading. Um, it can be a little tricky sometimes. This is depth measurements are some of the harder ones to do with a caliper. So uh, make sure you practice those. Now um, we're getting close to the end. Um, just want to talk about some GD and T. Um, calipers are not the most accurate tool, but they are capable of some GD and T uh, measurements. So um, if your tolerance is you know, wide open on these GD and T, uh, you can measure circularity. Circularity, you're just going to grab a diameter and you're going to spin it around and, and see how much the uh, diameter changes as you go around. Uh, position. You can do that um, by grabbing, you know, from the edge of a hole, bottom of a bottom of a plane, whatever your um, whatever your datum is. So you certainly can. You just need open tolerances, wide open. Um, so hopefully your print has that way. If you're going to be using a caliper, if you don't, you might have to use a height gauge for position or a CMM. Parallelism, uh, pretty much the same thing. You're going to go across from your datum uh, to your other plane, and you're going to do that in multiple places. So I'll do that here, and I'll do that over here, and I'll just keep moving it um, from left to right, get all my readings. And whatever difference I get, uh, maybe I get a three thousandths uh, variation from the lowest to the highest, uh, and that is my uh, parallelism error. Um, so those are the three that you can do if your tolerances are open. You can also do runout um, in some situations. Um, 
I don't really have a part here to demonstrate run out. Uh, but if, uh, you know, if this ring gauge was a, an actual part, oh, you know what? No, I don't have it. Um, you can go from the outside to the inside and you're going to grab and whatever difference as you rotate this thing around, whatever your difference is, you're comparing this outside surface to the inside surface. That is basically a definition of run out. Um, you can do it that way uh, with a caliper and symmetry. You know, sometimes um, if you if you need something to be symmetric, you can just use your caliper uh, to measure something um, is evenly spaced. So if you have a slot right there in the middle of your part, you can grab from one edge to the slot, the other edge to the other slot, other side slot. And if the slot is supposed to be right dead set in the center, then um, your two, uh, let me draw this out, your two um, measurements should be the same. So, if you had a slot on flange, all right, and you need this to be, you need this slot to be dead center uh, from some datum. We would call this um, datum A. And if this is not proper GDNT call out, please don't uh, come after me. I'm just uh, trying to <laughs> demonstrate a principle here. Um, if, if this distance with your caliper is the same as this distance with your caliper, then you know the slot is centered relative to the outside, which actually, yeah, it should probably be uh, data made this way. Um, okay. So uh, there you go. Uh, if you do it that way, um, you can grab your, you can use your caliper, grab this side of the part, this side of the part, if they're the same, then the slot is centered. If they're not the same, the slot's not centered, and there could be you, you have to start a little investigation about which which side is smaller than which side is bigger, which side is right, which side is wrong. Um, but you can do that um, if you need to. All right. Oh, I've got this little problem again. You know how to fix it. All right, we're going to jump ahead back to where we were. All right, so uh, we're, at, we're at our summary. So remember, you know, I tried to demonstrate the four different uh, measurement functions as many times as I reasonably could. Um, you're going to get a large range out of this. I mean, there's, how many micrometers have a six inch range? Some only have like a 0.2 range or even less. So this is what makes it so versatile. It's the range. Uh, I call it the Swiss Army knife of gauges because of how much uh, the four different measurement functions and the large range. And I mean, it's pretty much true. You're going to be you're, you're going to be able to measure anything with a caliper. The question comes down to should you measure everything with it, or when do you use another gauge? So. Um, I'll have more videos about those other gauges and when to use them. Um, and, you know, in reality, you know, I put on here inexpensive. This is for, for as much measurement capability as you get for it. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, you know, $100, $125 uh, for a good uh, six inch caliper uh, is going to get you a lot of use. And uh, I highly recommend you uh, invest if you're going to be a a CNC machinist, an inspector, long term, the company's not going to get you a good one. This is one of those things where it'll be useful to you. You're going to be using it all the time. Uh, not the not true in every case, but in many cases. But you know, as I as I said, the last one there. Um, just remember, it's lower accuracy than anything else I'm going to talk about in this video series. So um, there are limits to its uses when you have uh, some high tolerance features. Um, so you're going to have to decide if the tolerance is appropriate. And again, I recommend you use 
this, uh, this page here, typical bidirectional accuracy, 1,000. So plus or minus 1,000 from everything you read with a 6-inch caliper. And you should verify that with your manufacturer. If you're not sure, you might want to err on the side of caution and say plus or minus 2 thousandths um, from everything, especially going up to 12 inches. So um, that's it. Uh, I want to thank you guys uh, for watching. Um, after this video, I want you guys to check out um, the video on calipers where I'm going to demonstrate how to measure this part. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of exercises using this part and step shaft part. And I'll show you how to do, um, how to use the caliper to measure uh, most of the features on this. Uh, some of the critical techniques uh, when you're using your caliper. Uh, so I recommend you check that video out. And um, please check out the website for more videos, more training. And I do want to thank the Laney College in uh, the Peralta School District, um, where they provided uh, some of these machine parts, uh, the tools here. Um, it's a great program uh, in, in the Northern California Bay Area in Oakland. So if you're interested in uh, manufacturing, uh, CNC, manual machining, inspection, um, all kinds of things, the welding, assembly, mechanical drives. They've, they've got a lot of great courses there. So I recommend uh, check that out if you're in the Bay Area watching these videos. Um, and uh, until next time, thank you.